Good morning from Washington, D.C., and good day to all of our colleagues who have joined us for the second week of our virtual academic program, Cyberspace Security Priorities for Africa's National Security Actors. Well, my name is Nate Allen, and I am the Assistant Professor of Security Studies here at the Africa Center. And I'm the Africa Center's faculty lead for this program, as well as on cyber issues more broadly. I am delighted to moderate today's conversation. So before we get into to the, the conversation today, I'd like to briefly summarize a couple of key takeaways from last week. So if you all may recall, during the first week, we discussed Africa's cyber threat landscape, and we focused specifically on the threats from espionage, critical infrastructure sabotage, organized crime, and combat innovation, as well as some of the threat, the key threat actors. And there are really three things I'd like to highlight from both last week's plenary session, as well as our discussion groups. So first, I wanna make note that we have really a tremendous variety of participants and perspectives that have joined us for this program. There are over 100 registered participants, and this includes security sector officials, academics, civil society representatives from over 30 African countries. And there are significant differences in our levels of expertise on cyber issues as well. Some of you may have extensive background in African security, but not much experience on cybersecurity, whereas others are among the continent's most seasoned cybersecurity professionals and experts. And just to want to make clear that we've, we've intentionally cultivated this diversity. As, as Dr. Luca said in his opening remarks last week, there really isn't enough mutual understanding between the national security community and the cybersecurity community, particularly in Africa. Cybersecurity professionals can at times fail to frame issues in ways that are compelling to national security leaders or focus on the technical and tactical aspects of their work without thinking about the policy and strategic level implications. Um, security sector leaders, by contrast, don't engage with cybersecurity at times because they don't feel that it's important or because they, they feel they lack the technical expertise. This is tenable because I think as we really clearly established during our conversation last week, cyber issues are increasingly becoming core national security concerns in Africa and elsewhere. And one of the main objectives of this course is to foster fruitful discussion and engagement between those who are both new to cybersecurity as well as to more seasoned cybersecurity professionals inter interested in learning more about the intersection between cybersecurity and national security. Um, so second, one key takeaway from me last week was the degree, to, the degree to which we have a pretty strong consensus among you about the nature of the threats from espionage, critical infrastructure, sabotage, organized crime and combat innovation, as well as the consensus with respect to the most significant threat actors, uh, that is violent extremist groups and cyber enabled criminal organizations. Um, as Noel, my colleague Noel put it, who has joined us today last week, um, these, these two groups are probably the most significant threats to strategic stability across Africa. And so it's, it's, a, little, it's a little surprise that they're of most concern to our national security community. Um, for those who are interested in learning more, I strongly encourage you to, to check out our two webinars we had looking at the cyber dimensions of the threats, both from extremist groups or violent extremist groups and from organized criminal organizations. Um, so we've, we've come at this both from a threat perspective and from an, Afri an actor perspective as well here at the Africa Center. We're very interested in those perspectives. And the final point I wanna highlight and, and one that I hope should resonate with our diverse audience we have assembled here is the need to adopt the citizen-centric security lens when thinking about responding to these threats. Uh, this is because as multiple colleagues emphasized last week, Cybersecurity is an inherently multi-stakeholder enterprise. And to be effective, governments need the trust and the collaboration of the private sector, where the human capital and technical expertise lies, as well as civil society, which is crucial to ensuring that information technology is used in a way that fosters trust, accountability, and transparency between citizens and their government. So I hope we'll keep these considerations in mind as we move from discussing the strategic cyber threat landscape now over the next three weeks to discussing how to address the threats we've laid out. And for today's session, we're gonna focus on broadly the key elements of a national response to cyberspace security and kind of assess and take stock of that response across the African continent. We have three specific learning objectives in mind. First, 
we want to identify the key elements, actors, and stakeholders involved in designing and implementing a national response to cyberspace security challenges. Second, we want to assess the degree to which governments across Africa are adopting national cyber policies, strategies, and institutional arrangements, arrangements to deal with these obstacles and challenges they face. And finally, we want to take stock of the security sector's role as part of a broader multi-stakeholder approach to address the cyber threats we've discussed uh, last week. Um, and it's my real pleasure and honor to, to be with two highly distinguished panelists to kick off this week's discussion on the core elements of a national response. I invite both of them to turn on their, their video at this time if they haven't already. And just I'll just make note that I think for many of you, both at the Africa Center and in the, in the cybersecurity community, these panelists really need no introduction, um, but I'll do it anyway. So first, first we have Kabisa Kamara, who is the Director of External Affairs and Africa Policy at the, at, at, for the Tony, at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change and a senior visiting expert for the Sahel at the United States Institute of Peace. She has experience at the highest levels of government on both national security and cybersecurity policy, serving as chief of staff to the president, minister of foreign affairs, and minister of digital economy in the government of Mali prior to the coup in August 2020. Prior to her government service, Kamara held leadership positions in Washington, D.C. with the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, the National Endowment for Democracy, and Partners Global. Um, next, we have Mokhtar Yadali, who is the Africa Program Director for the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, a position he has held since January of 2021. Uh, many of our colleagues I here know him, I believe, when he was the head of the Information Society Division at the African Union, a position he held for nearly 15 years. And there he spearheaded some very notable initiatives, including the drafting of the African Union Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection, the preparation of the first ever report on cybersecurity trends in Africa, and the creation of the African Union Cybersecurity Experts Group, some of which I, I know have joined us uh, for this conversation today. So we are really truly delighted to have both of you with us this uh, today. And I could not think of a, a group of panelists really more qualified to give us both a broad assessment of national level cyber maturity in Africa and a discussion of the key challenges faced by senior policymakers across Africa as they grapple with the continent's rising cyber related threats. So let's, let's begin with this kind of broad overview and, and start with you, uh, Mokhtar. Um, as we discussed in our last session, governments across Africa face a wide rising array of cyber threats from state sponsored cyber espionage to explosive growth and organized criminal networks who are cyber dependent in some way and are attacking government networks, banks, and ports. And I'd like you to kick off our discussion by laying out what you think African governments need to do to respond to these strategic level cyber threats. What are the key elements of a national response that governments across Africa need to have in place to address rapidly uh, evolving and rising cyber threats? Mokhtar, over to you. Thank you, Nat, and uh, uh, I will sincerely will be apologizing for the bad connection I do have on my new area in Mauritania. And in case you don't hear me very well, I really sincerely apologize for that. Uh, second, I would like to thank you for the opportunity given really to contribute to this uh, wonderful seminar. My greetings to all of you, and I specifically, I see some of the members of the AU Cybersecurity Expert Group. But I also see uh, Amar Dahmani, who is also from the Center of uh, uh, Study on uh, Counterterrorism in Algeria. This is actually a very important one uh, within the African Union setup. The question you have asked is actually very wonderful, but, but let me just start from some broad kind of statements in order really to come to the specific itself. Uh, as you certainly know, the global economy is rapidly becoming digital, information and communication so technology is no longer just a specific sector, but it also is the foundation of all modern innovation in our economic systems. This is a great, the greatest actually ever uh, opportunity for African countries really to transform themselves and to catch up for the, uh, with the rest of the world in all socioeconomic development sector, be it education, finance, health, agriculture, food security, whatever it is. 
you name it. Uh, but also it has brought a lot of challenges uh, specifically on the um, cybersecurity threat. These electronic transactions that actually are forming the basis of our economies would not really happen unless we do have secure electronic transaction. Hence, the cybersecurity becomes something extremely important. How threat and cybersecurity landscape is actually uh, happening in Africa, it is really difficult to quantify at this point of time because of two things. One, most of the attacks, it appear that is targeting the uh, financial institutions and those institutions wouldn't like to speak about it or even mention it. However, the asset Deloitte uh, study has showed recently that fraud and finance has cost financial institution in the Eastern and Southern African something about $245 million a year. It also uh, has shown that cyber crime costs in South Africa, Nigeria, and Kenya economies put together is amount of $1.2 billion as a result of cyber crime. You certainly have noted that recently the African Union Commission in 2008 has been, uh, it has been reported that some footage and camera surveillance have been um, stolen or hacked or being, you know, actually subject to some sort of uh, sponsored cyber espionage. And let me just insist on this fact. One of the things important to align here is most of the threats are not detected by institutions themselves. It's always a third party and those who are being used as a proxy that are the one noticing that the uh, 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 criminal, criminal activity is uh, happening and hence uh, the African institutions, and in this case for the African Union Commission, is, uh, has been detected by a third party. Second, once it is actually detected, most of the country are able somehow technically to stop the, 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 the attack itself or the activity that are there, but unfortunately, they just stop there. They don't go beyond attribution to say exactly why and how and start to explain that. Because this is the basis of forming any kind of strategy with regard to uh, security in cyberspace. Now, cyber is common everywhere. For instance, in Ethiopia, you will see the country has been subject to, uh, in 2019, 2020, to 1,078 cyber attacks. Uh, mainly because of a lack of understanding from the user information and technology and the lack of the infrastructure in the country that they really has permitted this kind of thing to happen. Though they have actually been able to stop, as I say, it's more of seven, eight, 787 uh, uh, attacks that have been, you know, um, targeting many of the uh, financial institutions, but still many, most of them have been really just going uh, without being noticed. Now, apart from taking the specific decisions with regard to that, most of the government still don't understand the framework or the, um, how can, there is no yet a specific culture on cybersecurity. People still live in the illusion by thinking that the more software you buy, the more um, infrastructure you put in place, uh, you think that you are safe and you live in the illusion of safety. While in fact that cybersecurity culture, which is everywhere and should be actually not uh, in a specific institution like financial institutions, but everywhere across the, uh, the economic activities, even the citizens have also to be to make sure that they do have a specific behavior to be um, conducted or taken into consideration in order to say a lot of things. Now, uh, the threats are becoming more and more seriously happening. What is needed to be done at this point of time for the uh, African government is to address the issue of cybersecurity as a multi-stakeholder. It's not an issue of one institution, it's not an institu uh, issue of one citizen, it's an issue of all of us, and therefore, we need all of us to be concerned by that. The cyber threats are becoming more and more serious and therefore we need to have a robust national cybersecurity strategy with regard to that. We need to make sure that we have 
we are not looking in on the technical thing, but also we are looking at privacy, data protection, all of that are part of the cybersecurity landscape. We need to be able to share intelligence among the institutions, specifically among commercial institutions and public institutions to enhance that cooperation. We need to implement emerging uh, kind of plans for um, uh, uh, what we so-call uh, business continuity and uh, uh, business restoration, you know, all of that. And we need to have you know, those capabilities to address the uh, attacks when it is what is happening. So national strategy, cyber legislations and infrastructure that needs to be that, cooperation among them, those are the things that I see are needed at this point of time in the African continent in order to address the issue of cybersecurity. Over to you. So thank you very much, Mokhtar. And I, I think you just made a crucial point in pointing out that really responding to these threats isn't just a matter of buying new technology. It's a matter of policy and people. And I think kind of the four broad things you listed, national strategies, legal and, legal and legislative frameworks about around day, things like data sharing, um, information sharing and critical infrastructure protection, are all really core elements of a national cyberspace security policy. Um, I wanna ask you now for the next question specifically about the role of the security sector, given that we have a, a pretty broad audience of security sector officials with us today. And one of the things I'd just like to note is we've actually seen a pretty broad divergence in the role that security sectors across, across Africa are playing as part of this national response. Some countries, I'm thinking like Kenya, Senegal, Mauritius, it's the telecommunications ministries that nominally have the lead role in executing and formulating cybersecurity policy. In other countries, Nigeria and South Africa come to mind, it's really the security sector agencies that have more of a predominant role. So in your view, um, what role should security sector actors have as part of a broad national response? This is a great question. And as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the major issue of cybersecurity landscape in Africa is the issue of governance. In most of the countries, cybersecurity, as I say, is not apprehended or tackled as kind of a multi-actor, multi-stakeholder problem or problematic. Very often, its management is allocated to a traditional kind of security organs. Whatever the government just heard security, so I mean, pass it on to the Minister of Foreign Interior Affairs or pass it on to the Minister of Defense. On those, do have some specific what we call a cyber unit that most of the time are not incapacitated very well. And the consequences of that is a proliferation of sectorial kind of cybersecurity units, including those you have mentioned of telecom sector. These units are very seldom involved in the protection of what we call the country as, as, a, as, 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 as a whole. And they are not specifically also involved in what is now very important the critical infrastructure that has become more and more computerized and with an extensive use of IOTs, it is now become just the source of attack and cyber war and so on. So traditional and conventional cybersecurity organ, specific, specifically those that are in the regional level, like, you know, AFRIPOL should be working in close cooperation in partnership with all institutions in the continent, but also within the country itself, there should be a, a, the appropriate government to allow everybody to contribute as per uh, uh, its competency and so on. I have to insist on two things very important here. One, the cybersecurity is not only a matter of national kind of problematic or problem. It is part of the global challenges that we need. And the Africans need to be participate uh, in that global dialogue specifically in addressing within the EU system and all the institution, the norms and behaviors in cyberspace, the cyber diplomacy, uh, because international cooperation and regional cooperation are key in terms of addressing those kind of uh, criminals don't have boundaries. And those who are perpetrating attacks and anywhere else don't have a specific territory. They looked at the weakest links, they looked at you know, uh, where they can you know, take advantage of that. And Africa should not be really the weakest link and should be not the space of cyber aid. Because I see again, one of the issues that is happening is some countries are just coming into Africa trying to sell something, be it on the data protection, be it on the privacy, or be it in just selling the tools and the infrastructure in order to perpetuate that illusion of security I had mentioned at the beginning. 
So we, Africa should not be actually really the space of race because you remember in the last century, there was this uh, race over the uh, ideology and so on. And I'm seeing that it is happening now. And moreover, something else actually is coming. It's becoming now, Africa became the best test for those who are trying to test the, how they can attack infrastructure somewhere else where it is more profitable. Uh, and those because of the fact, the fact that in Africa, we don't really have a transparency on what is happening. If the water or the electricity is not happening for three, four days, nobody cares. And nobody explains why. We just wait until it comes back and wait until the next moment it goes back. Maybe, maybe. And this is a little bit uh, uh, confirmed by some of the intelligence services that those infrastructure is being attacked by some people to test their capabilities to address this or that. So while the uh, national uh, uh, conventional uh, security institution should be in the heart of things as part of their global kind of uh, action to protect the country, there should be a multi-stakeholder, multi-actor kind of setup in order to really uh, have the national uh, strategy, legislations, and infrastructure set up appropriately to address the issue of cybersecurity. Over, you. Over to you. No, thank you, Mokhtar. I think that's an excellent and, and key point that cybersecurity and cyber threats are non-traditional, so they demand sort of a different approach that's not a traditional security sector kind of taking complete control over, for example, critical information infrastructure. It requires security sector officials to be active and aware of the threats, probably more so than they are in most African countries, but also participate as part of a broader multi-stakeholder model to share intelligence, identify, and respond. So, so thank you for that, that point. Um, so for, for the, the final question, I'd like you to give us kind of a, a, an assessment of, from your view, kind of having worked in the African Union for well over a decade, where you see the continent is now in terms of its level of cyber maturity and its, its, its preparedness to address some of the threats at the national level that, that you laid out. So, so for example, if you look at some measures, say the United Nations Information Technology Union's Global Cybersecurity Index, I think there's on the one hand a, a pretty marked trend of improvement. If you see the number of countries that are adopting legal and legislative frameworks and, and things like uh, computer emergency response teams that are some of these multi-stakeholder entities you mentioned that respond to and address national security threats. But there's also a lot of divergence between some of the countries who are charging ahead and I think others who risk being left behind. So to what extent are African countries adopting these multi-stakeholder strategies, legal frameworks, institutional arrangements like intelligence coordination cells, computer emergency response teams? Um, what are some of the key challenges? And do you have any examples of, of African countries you think that others across the continent should learn from. Yeah, yeah. I, I will start with the last question, but I, I there is a several good examples in, in in a lot. When you took a look at a country like Mauritius, from all three parameters, I believe that are my indicators to uh, uh, see how the country is mature enough to be able to address or is in the right the right path to address issues of cybersecurity. You look, they have a good legislation, a good certain cert and they have a vision and a strategy. You look at Senegal, they do have the set of laws that are actually very advanced. Uh, you look at Ghana, you will see uh, um, that uh, uh, the laws and the facilities and the multi-stakeholder system is really mature in, in Ghana. You look at the uh, Morocco and Tunisia, they have a very good cert and cert and a very good agencies that are in charge of data protection. Just to tell you that there are very, very good examples. Uh, and uh, two years ago, I was, before leaving the African Union, I was monitoring the speech of the leadership. Uh, and I was always disappointed by the fact for the last 10 years, none of them in any official or formal speech has mentioned the issue of cybersecurity. And I see for the last two years, and I see the leadership of Africans are already starting mentioning cybersecurity in their endeavor, in their strategies, in their, in their campaigning even sometimes. I've seen one so doing that. So. Um, there is a momentum that is actually coming really uh, very positively into the continent. And if you look at the ITU Global Cybersecurity Index, you see that six African countries are among the first 50 countries in the world with a very impressive kind of cybersecurity uh, index. This is a show the impressive improvement that is happening just for the last two years. Um, the 
African countries are starting with the help, sometimes so very good partners like you know the European Union and so are actually really availing themselves for assessments, which is actually very good, creating awareness, developing national cybersecurity strategy, building infrastructure here and there. Um, the African Union is actually really pushing from the top down there. Uh, the creation of the African Union Cybersecurity Expert Group is actually one of the key really thing that is permitting the African Union and the African countries to be supported and advised by one of the 10 key experts selected really tightly from different regions to advise the African Union and so on. The Malabo Convention is actually going forward. I'm hoping that, we were hoping that by 2019, it would have been uh, kind of ratified, but given the COVID-19 situation, but I'm sure I see more country interested on doing so. Uh, so there is momentum there. There is something happening. The, what I would advise is just to keep on uh, improving the, how can I say, the uh, statistics. Uh, two years ago, 20%, less than 20% of African countries did have uh, uh, a cyber security strategy. Less than 20% did have uh, national cyber legislation and uh, actually less than 15% do have cert and cert and so on but things are moving forward. We need, just need to keep on improving those three areas. And I am sure that with the current momentum and the involvement of leadership, the African Union will come in. And I wouldn't miss the opportunity by saying that uh, as uh, I have been, the, the Global Forum for Cybersecurity has picked me specifically, I'm proud of that to really be the one leading the capacity building on that area in the area of cybersecurity. And we already have engaged with many of the countries to build their capacity in this area and to, to keep on really improving the situation. And I hope the mission will be as successful and within the next few years, we'll be really having a very robust and cyber space in the continent. Over to you. Thank you very much for that really fantastic overview, Mokhtar, and for all your leadership and your efforts to build the capacity of governments across Africa on cyber in terms of cyber maturity. I think you make clear that both for internal reasons, external reasons, um, rising threats, rising leadership, there's there's um, an awful that cyber issues are growing in importance, and there's a lot of African countries that are doing a lot to to deal with them. I think, you know, as we said in and I think our first the first um, session. Um, because uh, the continent's rapidly digitizing and a lot of digital technology is cheap and rapidly diffusing, there are really tremendous opportunities here for African governments if they wanna be on the leading edge of innovation to do so. And increasingly they are. I think you mentioned that there are now six governments now in the top 50 uh, most committed to cybersecurity in the ITU index. I believe that's up from three, just two or three years ago. So that just gives you a sense of how rapidly um, yeah. The continent's digitizing and, and how quickly some countries are, are, are barreling towards a significant amount of cyber maturity. Um, so now that now I've given this really great broad overview, I, I'd now like to go uh, from a broad overview about what's going on across the continent to help us get a deeper understanding of some of the key challenges faced by senior national level decision makers as they seek to develop legislative frameworks, develop strategies, develop institutional arrangements like certs that we just talked about in the first part of this conversation. And that's where you come in, Anissa. Um, as Molly's former Minister of Digital Economy, you've had firsthand experience shaping cybersecurity policy decisions at a high level. And I also think a, a country like Mali as a rapidly digitizing country that's also in the midst of armed conflict is experiencing some political instability, is in a situation that's quite similar to a number of countries across Africa that often aren't widely discussed in conversations about cybersecurity. So this is a great opportunity to hear your take. So I'd like to, to first back up a little bit, and I'd like you to start for us by describing what you see as Mali's cyber threat landscapes, its cyber-related threats and challenges. So, Misa, in your view, which types of cyber threats from espionage, critical infrastructure, sabotage, organized crime, combat innovation are, are most relevant and concerning to you? Uh, thank you, Nate. And I would also like to first thank um, ACSS for putting this academic program together. Um, 
like Mr. Yadali uh, uh, mentioned earlier, cybersecurity is an integral part of national security and can no longer be considered as completely uh, removed from it, which is unfortunately the, the case in, in most um, African countries. Um, in 2014, Mali designed um, its first national digital strategy. It was a, a strategy that would span from 2015 to 2020, so a five-year strategy. And out of the um, 64 pages included in this strategy, only half a page, so half a page, um, describes and in very vague terms what cyber threats are and how the digital strategy would, would help uh, counter those threats. What is um, important to note is that in the, in the strategy, the emphasis was put on the need to reinforce the, th the trust of citizens in digital solutions by providing a legal value to electronic data and not necessarily on the need to fight cyber threats because they are a menace to our nation's, uh, nation's security. And it was actually never uh, presented as such. So for the um, specific case of Mali, I would say that cyber threats are progressing as quickly as the digitalization of the, of the country. And um, we're seeing an increasing number of attacks in the banking system and many, many on social media that are mostly um, impersonation fraud. And um, you know, the issue of research and available data on the number of cyber threat um, or cyber attack incidents is definitely lacking. And I know that this was an issue that was mentioned um, last week. So there's no clear evidence as to uh, how many cyber attacks have taken place in Mali over the years or which infrastructure have been the most hit. And um, I would say, and that's my personal opinion, that the type of regulation that is actually missing right now in countries like Mali um, is a, a sort of a, a bill or um, something that would, that would force institutions to inform their customers when their data have been compromised. And that would kill multiple birds uh, with one stone. First, it would raise um, citizen awareness on cyber threats and what they are and how often they occur. And second, it would also ensure that institutions have a clear policy when it comes to the protection of um, private data. Thank you very much. So I think your remarks make uh, abundantly clear how the rapidly strategic cyber threats are growing as internet penetration increases, something that we, we talked a little bit about last week and seems inevitable regardless of your country's preparedness or level of, of development, um, et, et cetera. Um, so I, I'd like you to kind of unpack a little bit more for us about where Mali is along the key elements of a national response you began to identify. It sounds like there are, you know, there are, despite challenges and despite some difficulties in getting cybersecurity recognized by at least senior level policymakers, there are some substantive efforts that have been going on for much of the past decade in, in Mali. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned the digital strategy. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that Mali has a cybersecurity incidents response team, but I believe there was a 2019 cybercrime law that was passed mm -hmm. that I don't think did anything that you just mentioned in terms of forcing companies to report incidents, but mm -hmm. did attempt to address some of the, the cybercrime related challenges that, mm -hmm. that you just discussed. So broadly, if you could unpack for us a little bit more about what cybersecurity policies and strategies Molly has undertaken to respond to some of the threats we've been talking about over the first day and, and, and today, and, and what agencies are responsible for mm -hmm. cyberspace security in Mali. Yeah, so um, since 2015, Mali has adopted a set of important regulations to help prevent the spread of, of cyber crimes. And um, those laws were uh, put forward by the Minister of Digital Economy, of course, but also, inter interestingly, by the Ministries of Justice, of Commerce, of Defense, and Interior. So talking about... Um, a multi-stakeholder uh, um, regulation, uh, a number of ministries were definitely involved and they've all been involved in one way or another in drafting, in drafting the laws or defending them in front of the National Assembly. And so when it comes to um, cybersecurity, uh, and you, you mentioned it in your introduction, the most important law 
was uh, passed, passed in December 2019, when I was uh, still Minister of uh, Digital Economy, and the name of the law in French was uh, Loi portant sur la répression de la cybercriminalité. Uh, wow. Law on the suppression of cybercriminality. And relevant. Some of its provisions uh, did pose potential threats to privacy and freedom of expression online, in particular, given uh, Mali's uh, democratic failures and low rankings on, on press freedom. And so the new law um, applies, and I quote, I wrote it down, the new law applies to, and I quote, any offense committed by means of information and communication technologies in whole or in part on the territory of the Republic of Mali, any offense committed in cyberspace and the effect the effects of which are produced on national territory. It's part of a legislative uh, framework uh, deemed necessary to support uh, reforms in the ICT sector in accordance with the uh, Mali telecommunications sector policy declaration of um, 2000. And so the law was passed while the actual constitution of Mali guarantees the confidentiality of communications under its Article 6, uh, a provision which is reinforced by Article 5 of, of the law on the, on the protection of personal data. And so the law on, on cybercrime does conflict um, with constitutional dispositions when it comes to the right to privacy. So I believe that the, the 2019 law will definitely ensure safe and secure use of ICTs in Mali. However, it came about in a, in a very fragile context. Um, the provisions on um, data processing and criminal investigation procedures um, uh, pose a, a significant risk to the integrity, security, and confidentiality of personal data. Uh, in addition, the law um, places a very heavy burden on uh, telecommunications intermediaries to track and monitor uh, network activity and holds these intermediaries accountable for the actions of their customers. And I know that uh, Mr. Yudali mentioned, uh, mentioned that, that, that fact um, uh, earlier. The provisions on um, online press offenses are incompatible with media law in the digital age. And so the new law and existing related laws, therefore, I guess, require you know, re revisions to safeguard and enforce uh, constitutional guarantees of freedom of expression and privacy, whether online and, off and offline. And I'm sorry for, for that, because I didn't want to give you like a legal lecture on uh, telecoms in Mali, but I think it's important for us to you know, understand how uh, new this issue of cybersecurity is and how challenging it is to regulate the cyberspace when freedom of expression and freedom of the press are easily violated in fragile countries um, that have a very volatile security situation like it is the case um, in Mali. Thank you very, very much. So I think your, your remarks raised an issue that gets at the heart of cybersecurity issues that they frankly, countries across the world, not just in Africa are wrestling with right mm -hmm. now which is that, you know, the cyber threats they face are really, really real. You know, it's possible for criminals all over the world to steal data, to sabotage critical infrastructure, you know, mm -hmm. to, to basically hold the United Nations economy hostage. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's critical for security sector officials to have both resources, capabilities, and, you know, the ability to, to prosecute, to identify and track those who are responsible at the same time in the process of giving the security sector those kinds of responsibilities, you at times run up against uh, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, things that are their core democratic values. And I think it's a, it's a challenge that, that, that uh, democracies across the world are, are struggling to address and, and confront right now. And I, I think, you know, so I, I think you highlighted how security sector involvement in cyberspace security Mm -hmm. because it possesses both um, opportunities, but also risks. So kind of for, for my last question, I'd like you to, to discuss a little bit more about the role that the security sector has mm -hmm. taken on in cyberspace security policy in Mali and maybe across Africa more broadly. I think this is particularly important, you know, in light of their recent uh, coup d'etat, it's important to know whether or not some of those kind of policies you mentioned might have uh, 
decreased security sector transparency and enabled some of the what, what happened. Um, so, so the question is, is, is what role do security sector actors in Mali have in identifying and responding to cyber security related threats? And from your experience, what are the key risks that stem from security sector involvement in cyberspace security? So when I talked about the, the you know, different ministries involved in the drafting of the cybersecurity uh, set of regulations, what I forgot to mention um, is that the, the ministries of uh, defense, the Ministry of Defense had the lead. So the cyber crimi uh, criminality law was actually undersigned by um, the Ministry of Defense and then uh, later by uh, the other ministers in charge who just basically signed off on, on the law that was already reviewed and, and uh, um, approved by, by the Ministry of Defense. And so, um, you know, to give you an example of, of the role that the security sector uh, uh, plays in, in enforcing the law, the Malian cybercrime law does authorize the search of and confiscation of computers during criminal investigation procedures. And I believe it might be the case um, in the US based on the many movies that I saw about uh, cyber criminality. Um, but in addition, um, under Article 7, uh, 75 of, of that law, data may be copied and stored um, when um, quote unquote, the media entry does not appear to be appropriate. And so the law does not provide for how the copied data is to be stored, processed, or deleted uh, following investigations. And this undermines the principle of data protection set out in um, uh, Article 7 of the Personal Data Protection Act that says that personal data should only be kept for a specific period of time and a specific purpose. And um, in addition, Articles 83 to 86 of the law suggests real-time surveillance of ordinary citizens by uh, intercepting uh, communications. And so service providers are required to cooperate with security authorities in particular by ensuring that they have the necessary technical means to facilitate the interception of communications. And so these you know, very broad powers um, that the security sector has in enforcing the cyber criminality law added to, um, uh, to, to those uh, granted under section four of the Te Telecommunications Act states that, and I quote, when public security or the defense of the territory of Mali so requires, the government may for a limited period requisition all the telecommunications networks established on the territory of Mali, as well as the equipment connected to it and or prohibit the provision of telecommunication services. And so this article has been used in the past um, when the government ordered, um, uh, for example, the social media shutdown in 2016 during public protests. Um, more recently, uh, an, inter an internet shutdown in the 2018 presidential election, and even very recently in 2020, when there were popular uh, protests in, in Bamako. So, you know, to come back to our initial question, the role of the security sector in preventing cyber threats is key. Um, if the, it is the security sector that is in charge of protecting the, the country against aggressors, whether um, external, aggressors or national ones or even virtual ones. And so they cannot be put aside when addressing cyber threats. So I'm not against um, such heavy involvement of the security sector in enforcing uh, the, the cyber, uh, cyber criminality law. The challenge, however, is in the excess or excessive use of the powers vested in the security sector to combat th those threats. They can very easily infringe uh, on freedom of expression because the law can be interpreted um, in any way the security sector uh, wants to. The word threat is not clearly defined in the law. So anyone who speaks, for example, against a regime uh, uh, can be deemed as a threat and can be tried. And this was the case actually in late uh, 2020 um, uh, when four very quiet, you know, citizens were accused 
by the uh, military junta um, um, to be preparing a coup against, <laughs> against basically the junta that took power over in a military takeover. And so the military regime invoked communications that were intercepted and those individuals uh, did spend four months in jail before being released without charge. And this, it was later found that um, these individuals had very close ties to um, a presidential contender who could very well win um, the next election. So I will stop there. Thank you. No, th thank you very, very much. So I think that, you know, you make it clear how important it is to have very specifically defined laws that to some degree limit the security sector's powers and in, 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 in making them accountable to, to civil society as some kind of civilian oversight. Otherwise, you're potentially just opening them up for abuse for political purposes, which kind of as a security sector expert, I can tell you, I don't think it's either interest in the long term of the security sector being politicized in that way or used as a political tool in that way or of, of the citizens. So I, I think, you know, you make it highlight the need for kind of much more important but narrowly defined specific powers that more clearly define the threats, more clearly define what is permissible. And that, that I think, you know, according to the, the autocracy are, are in line with the democratic principles enshrined in constitutions um, everywhere. So, so thank you for that. Um, so I think, I think both Mokhtar and, and Kamisa have done a really excellent job of laying out you know, the broad uh, how cyber maturity landscape across Africa, given us a good sense that there's been really, really rapid progress, but also some really, really key challenges in terms of um, both the security sector needing to have a role in cyberspace security to address these threats, but also some of the key risks that are involved.